let's take our Bibles now and open them to uh, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Now we're dealing with the third church. Oh, before we get on with this, uh, let me also make another announcement that uh, Mike has had his surgery and um, he uh, seems to be coming along all right, at least the report that I was able to get from the hospital. All right, now then, the second chapter of the book of the Revelation, and we are dealing with the message to the third church. Now then, what uh, uh, prize A student do I have this morning who is able to give me the seven churches of the book of the Revelation? Do I see any uh, little hand uh, that's able to give me the seven churches? Come on. Now, I'll guarantee you, you're going to have to all give me those seven churches before we get through with the seven churches. So who would like to try it out this morning? Come on, Helen. Oh, okay, here, Jean. All right, and one more. Laodicea. Did you say it? Okay. All right, fine and dandy. All right, now we're ready for verses 12 through verse 17. And by this time, I am sure you have gotten acquainted with rather a little simple outline concerning the message to these churches. Uh, it follows so nicely by way of you know, an outline and progression of thought. And I'm going to once again read these verses with reference to the church at Pergamos. And then I want you to tell me the chief characteristic of the church at Pergamos. What is the major difficulty or the major characteristic concerning this particular church at Pergamos. Now you watch it carefully. And to the angel of the, church, to, of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's throne is literally. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith even in those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication, so that thou also hast them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. <coughs> Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now, does anyone want to give me uh, the chief characteristic of this particular church, the church at Pergamos? What is the chief characteristic of this church at Pergamos? Do you have any particular idea? Don't be afraid. Just uh, uh, if you want to and make a venture, why, uh, you feel free to do that. And then we'll just discuss it a little bit. That's it? False doctrine. False doctrine is certainly there. Isn't that right? False doctrine is certainly there. Absolutely so. Now then, let me sort of uh, lead you out in another question. What is the consequences of a church having false doctrine? What is the declared consequence in this particular church for a church having false doctrine? What do you think? 
Why do you suppose we have the introduction, uh, the prologue given to us of the Lord that hath a sharp sword with two edges? Hmm? What's he going to do with this sharp two-edged sword? Discipline or judgment. Isn't that right? Here we have a church. Here we have a church that I think one of the chief characteristics with reference to this particular church is that here is a group that is under impending judgment. Impending judgment. Now, we might not all agree with reference to that, but certainly we've got some things mentioned that lends itself to the possibility of real judgment. Now then, once again, let me just emphasize what these churches are all about. Now, these seven churches in the book of the Revelation are seven literal churches in the apostolic days. Now, those seven literal churches existed with these seven major particular problems, and each one of the churches got the entire message of the problem, which was at Ephesus, which was at uh, Smyrna, which was the Thyatira, and Pergamos, and you just keep naming them. Got all of these letters. Now then, I believe that the scriptures are pointing out to us the chief areas of difficulty in these churches, and maybe some of the others had the same thing, but he gives to us these seven churches to illustrate the spiritual condition of the church at large throughout the entire church age. Because, why do I say that? Is because of the present tense that you have in each one of these letters. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, is saying to the church. And you will notice that this is in absolute harmony with the key to the book in the first chapter, verse 19, where it says, Write the things which thou hast seen, that's the past. Now then, the things which are, that's dealing with the present. And the things which shall be hereafter, that's dealing with the future. And then when you come to chapter 4, verse 1, while you have the Spirit of God reminding the beloved disciple John to record some things which shall take place after these things or after the present time. It's a wonderful inspired outline to the book of the Revelation. And uh, so the emphasis for these seven churches, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches for the entire church age. Now then, the first problem you have in the book of emphasis, uh, the book of the Revelation with reference to the book of Ephesus is that they had a difficulty having left their first love. During the having left that which was of a priority uh, essential as far as believers are concerned. But then when you came to the church at Smyrna, we found that here was a church that is not uh, raked over the coals too much, but uh, the, the big difficulty is that they are suffering, and so it's a suffering church with impending further suffering. But now, when you come to the church at Pergamos, well, you have the prologue, once again, given in verse 1. And notice again the recipient. The recipient is the messenger of the church in Pergamos. Again, here is a single individual that is responsible for conveying the message to the church at Pergamos. Now, again, we have a great deal of difficulty in our present day over an argument concerning uh, the fact whether there should be one that's called a one-man ministry or whether there should be a plurality that's involved. Well, I certainly know this. As far as the churches of Revelation are concerned and for the entire church age, if they illustrate, and I'm sure they do, that here is one that's held responsible for conveying God's message to the people in that church. So if you want to draw swords with reference to a single 
uh, ministry or plurality, well, I think that uh, you'll have to back off because there are places that lend themselves to supporting both positions. Therefore, I don't get too wrought up with reference to that issue. Now, the second thing with reference to the prologue is that we have the great presentation of the person of the Lord Jesus once again in a particular characteristic. The one that's walking in the midst of the churches, the one who's holding the messengers in his hand, he says, listen, I have a message for the church at Pergamos, and I am the one that has the sharp two-edged sword. Now that sharp two-edged sword is a sword that's going to cut both ways. Isn't that right? Now then, with a sword cutting both ways, we can expect some very, very careful examination by the Spirit of God concerning this church and the impending judgment that's going to fall concerning some problems. Now then, in verse 13, you have the note of praise or the note of commendation. And I, I really like this because here is a church that even though there is so much by way of difficulty concerning the church here at Pergamos, there is a matter for praise that is just absolutely marvelous. Now, notice what he says. I know your works, and where Satan dwelleth, even where Satan's seat or throne is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. There are three things, three things here, for which the church at a Pergamos is commended. First of all, he says, I take note of your works. I take note of your works. Actually, here in, uh, I know where thou dwellest, actually. Um, they dwell in a place that is most difficult. And they are at work in this most difficult place. We like to get out of the difficulties, don't we? We don't like we don't like to have problems. We don't like to have difficulties at all. What we endeavor to do is we endeavor to shun those difficulties. Isn't that right? Listen, the Lord Jesus said, look, I know, I know where you have to work. I know where you're working in Pergam uh, Pergamos. And now notice the next thing down. And you hold fast my name. You're holding fast my name. You have a grip of identification with me. It's just absolutely marvelous for some of these people. And the difficulty in which they and then secondly, or thirdly, they haven't denied. They haven't denied his name. Absolutely not. Well, for a group of people like this, this adds volumes of commendation when we realize the area of difficulty in which they find themselves. First, I find Satan's throne is there. I find that Satan dwells there. Folks, when you've got Satan in the presence, and he's ruling in many cases, that's a difficult situation, isn't it? Boy, my heart just goes out to the people at Pergamos. Where they dwell in light of their works, where they hold fast to the Lord and won't deny his name, 
in the face of the ruling enemy of the Lord Jesus, and he's taken out residence there. There's a group of people that you want to take your hat off to. It's, uh, it's marvelous. There are some believers that find themselves in situations that it just seems as though Satan himself is busy in their presence. And um, your heart goes out to them. Now it's a little different situation today than it was back then because you see there was only one church in one locality. There weren't a number of other churches. Today we've got the plurality of churches in various localities and uh, you can separate yourself from such stuff. But in this case, these dear ones were hedged in in a particular spot. Now then, you come to the problem. From the praise to the problem in verse 14, uh, verse 14 and 15. Now notice what it is. Even though these people are commended so highly, they are permitting something to take place. Here's an area of compromise that does not bring for one moment the approval of the Lord. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine, the teaching of Balaam, to cast a stumbling block for before the children of Israel to eat, eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. You've got the doctrine of Balaam there. Now, you know what? The elders, as far as the church is concerned, the elders are responsible to maintain purity of doctrine as far as the church is concerned. Now, some of you who are here realize that in days past, we have dealt with certain areas of doctrine that needed clarification and we've done some teaching in this regard and we are quite forceful in maintaining purity of doctrine if at all possible now then here is the church at Pergamos that they need in light of their problem they need to address this difficulty they need to address the difficulty of a doctrine called the doctrine of Balaam. Now then, what does that doctrine do? Okay, just look at it. It's a doctrine, it's a doctrine which causes the people of God to stumble. And in this particular case, it is a terrible stumble. It is a stumble from the standpoint of morality and it is a standpoint of ministry of worship. There happens to be those who are involved in immorality, and there are those that are involved in false worship. And this needs to be addressed. And if it is not addressed, it is something that has a real impending danger. Now notice the prospect of this danger. Verse 16. Verse 16. We have just five minutes left. I think we can finish this. It says, Repent. Now you take care of this doctrine of difficulty. Repent, or else I will come unto thee, and I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I'm going to fight against those that are involved in false doctrine. And it is a message to these believers to take care, address the difficulty of the moral problems. 
Now then, there's the plea. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Here's the plea. In other words, give heed. And boy, do I love the promise now. Notice the great promise of reward. To him that overcometh. And what do you think the overcomer is? I think the overcomer is that who is able to conquer the difficulty. In fact, he stated the problem of the doctrine of uh, this in verse 17. You have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and that is the superiority of the conquering of people with reference to doctrinal teaching. Now, I, I, I've had personally to deal with this on a personal basis with a number of uh, people who have been involved in Northland Bible College and Northland Bible Chapel. Now then, you absolutely cannot have uh, superiority, you cannot have supremacy within view of drawing people to oneself to draw them into an affiliation with them in contrast to the ministry of the Word. So, he said, now listen, those who will overcome this, those who repent, notice, three great things. I will give him to eat of the hidden manna, will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knew, saving he that hath received it. Three exclusive blessings. Three exclusive blessing. The first exclusive blessing is spiritual sustenance. I will give him to eat of the hidden manna. Now this hidden manna is manna. It's in a, it's, it's in a perfect tense. It is hidden, has been hidden, and continues to be hidden. In other words, I will give him to eat of the sweetness of a spiritual banquet that only the host can provide, and that is the Lord Jesus. In the third chapter, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me. Folks, if you will overcome, if you repent of a false doctrine which leads to a false manner of life, listen, you have the greatest promise in the world. A number of people have experienced in days past these difficulties that you're talking about, the moral problem and the other problem. They've repented. And you know, some of those dear people right today are knowing the preciousness, preciousness of the manna of the word of the Lord. And they're growing and they're blessed. And isn't it wonderful? It sure is. Now then, secondly, I'll give to him a white stone. I don't know what this stone is. It doesn't tell me what it is. But it does tell me the character of it. It's a stone of purity. It's purity. Purity for those who need to repent, that gives you that gives you the full truth of what is involved in repentance. Boy, when the Lord cleans you up, folks, I don't care what you've been in, you're cleaned up. Absolutely so. You stand just as right before God as anyone else. You do. If you'll repent. Absolutely so. And a promise to you some kind of a reward that's a purity. But now, add to that wonderful reward. And in the stone, and in the stone, an exclusive name. A name of identification. That's what your name is, isn't it? You're, you're known by your name. A name of identification which no man, no one will know except the one that receives it. Isn't that precious? Folks, you can't beat that. And uh, uh, this letter to Pergamos, with all its difficulties, with all of its impending judgment of the Lord with his two-edged sword, 
I'll tell you, precious people, if you repent and let the Lord clean you up, you've got the promise. You've got the promise of a blessing that's exclusive, absolutely exclusive. No one except an identification provided by the one who's going to reward you and only you. Personal, personal, exclusive blessing. And I'm going to quote a verse in closing. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him. And now notice, I will manifest. I will manifest myself unto him. An exclusive personal relationship that can only be experienced by the individual himself. But that's a promise to you and a promise to me if we will comply with a great love letter of glory. Isn't it marvelous, folks? Absolutely so. The message to you. Repent. Repent. Or I'm going to come and I'm going to fight you. I'm going to fight you. You can even, you can either have a fighting Lord or a rewarding Savior. You choose. You choose. It's just that simple. And it's that plain. And it's straight from the shoulder of your wonderful Lord, isn't it? Our Father, thank you, thank you so much for the great blessing of your wonderful, precious word. Father, you're so good to us to unveil to us the heart, the heart of your Savior, the heart of yourself. Dear Father, be pleased to continue to minister to us. Enlarge our lives. Fortify us with yourself. And may we know what it means to be those conquerors conquering by repenting. 